Good morning. Good morning. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. I want to welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to this time of celebrating Easter and uh, the joy of the resurrection of Christ. And in our coming together, I pray that the ability to reflect on this experience is not just something we do in our heads, but it touches our hearts and it changes our lives to live as people who know the power of the resurrection in our own lives. And today we welcome the Brass Quintet. Uh, Roxy, do you want to say anything about our musical group today? You can use the microphone. I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Brass Quintet for making our Easter a special Sunday. And um, it happened to be that uh, our choir members were going out of town. And what a perfect setting to, uh, you know, to praise God with the beautiful music that they're going to give us. And so um, most of them uh, I know from musicians at, at the Genesee Symphony Orchestra. And uh, by the way, we have a concert May 1st at the college. <laughs> Got to plug that. And um, so welcome to the Brass Quintet. And Kevin McLeod is um, our first trumpeter in the orchestra. And he's the leader of the group. Great. Thank you so much. Enjoy. Marie, do you want to say anything, uh, or do you want me to say something about the flowers? Are we giving them away today? I think we are. We can make that decision. Yes? <laughs> I think you should. So today, here's the way. I mean, traditionally, we've said, take whatever you would like. But I want to invite you to make this also about the power of the resurrection in your life and in somebody's life. So if you think of someone who needs extra love or an experience of uh, the love of this congregation, feel free to take one of these uh, for them, I guess, uh, as a reminder of uh, Christ's resurrection today. And so we've been working through a sermon series looking at the invitation of Jesus to follow him and adding the word Come follow me home, uh, thinking of living each day in light of eternity and what it means to live uh, and being aware of our citizenship here on this earth, but also being part of eternity. And today, I want to reflect with you on the power of the resurrection in our lives, because it's not just an experience that took place a long time ago. It is something that happens for us right here, right now. And so uh, one of the experiences I reflected on uh, was watching a show called Rogue Trip. I don't know if you've seen it, but it came out a couple of years ago. And this is uh, father and son, but uh, the key person is Bob Woodruff, who was a reporter, a war reporter. And so he had an accident. Uh, there was a major uh, explosion, and this was in Iraq. He was reporting on the war in Iraq. And he had brain injury as a result. And so it's really powerful to see him uh, recovered 
and able to do something to help us understand the world better and appreciate more of the world and the positive uh, that comes of life after such an experience. So we'll watch a little um, news clip about this uh, story. It really is an unbelievable opportunity, traveling the globe with your dad, especially if your dad is ABC's Bob Woodruff. And lucky for us, it's all caught on camera. It feels very fitting that on the eve of my adventure with my dad, I'm here with him. All right, time to pack a passport. A lot of glasses because I'm blind. I gotta go pack the clothes. Can you believe this is happening? No, can't believe it. At a time when many of us are itching just to resume our daily activities, let alone set out on any travel, comes a new adventure show. This one captured through the lens of a father and son relationship. Graceful. Very graceful. As usual. Filmed right before the start of the pandemic in some of the most remote countries in the world, arguably better known here in America for the grim headlines they generate instead of its tourist attractions. The media who comes here, they are only interested in war. They only show that part, that sides of Pakistan. And the positive side, the world never gets to learn about this part. That's why we're here. The series Robe Trip takes us to the Colombian Amazon, where Jack and the Beanstalk comes to life as trees grow up to 200 feet tall, and where we discover a turtle rodeo in Papua New Guinea. A professional photographer, it's the first time Mac Woodruff is spending time with his dad as a colleague. Man, this is like a dream come true type thing. His dad is Bob Woodruff, a veteran ABC News journalist who for decades has been crisscrossing the globe to cover conflicts and wars. In 2006, while covering the war in Iraq, the convoy in which Bob and his team were traveling struck a roadside bomb. He suffered traumatic brain damage and was not expected to survive. He spent 36 days in a coma, followed by months in recovery. Somehow getting hit by a bomb and basically dying? has not discouraged him in the slightest from seeing this world, from finding beautiful people, from seeking out beautiful places, regardless of where they are. Because the experience was so traumatic for the family and not wanting their children to grow up fearful of what had happened, Bob and his wife Lee, instead of fearing, encouraged adventure. This is what I want Mac to know, that beyond the headlines in places like this, you mostly meet people who love their homes and want to share that love with the rest of us. Their four months of travel is now streaming on Disney Plus, which shares the same parent company as ABC News. It's known as the Serengeti of South America, and we've come to a private wildlife reserve owned by a local ranching family to meet the legendary barefoot cowboys of Colombia, the Gineros. Hello. Listo? Uh, Mac, is this your first time on a horse? It's not my first time on a horse. Okay. I've walked around with them before, but by no means have I trotted the open savanna. Okay. So we'll see how it goes. I think, I think it's the first time you've been on a horse that's not a pony. <laughs> All right, Dad. This series plays off the father-son relationship as much as it does its stunning locations, inevitable as they're always together. I'm right behind him usually, and he can sleep on anything, so on a... On a road like this, he's probably sleeping, and he's like bashing his head up against the window, and he's still asleep the whole time. It's incredible. But then sometimes I'm like, oh, I think my dad's asleep, and then I'll look over, and he's just answering emails like that. He's just refreshing his inbox, typing stuff to my mom. <laughs> Though, who knew Bob had so many dad jokes? How did, how did they come up with the name Anteater? Does he eat ants? Just yeah. kidding. <laughs> Sorry about him. Yeah, no, no, He's cool. Right. Yeah, I know. I know. I know, I'm a little weird. Yeah. <laughs> the show introduces subcultures that many may be unfamiliar with, including some of the customs of the Ismaili Muslims in the Kunza Valley in Pakistan. We also see another big change that I love in that region, which drew me to Hunza to begin with, is the spirit of community. If there's one family that's poor, the entire community will help them get, not, not give them charity, but employ them so they feel like they've earned that money. Sounds incredible. This is, this is a, truly a magical part of the country. Other customs involve negotiating for goats in Ethiopia. Say, Mr. Lo. 
He said you have to negotiate secretly. Secretly? Secretly, yeah. Ah. Ah, not with the mouth. So you say like this, how much the price? Ah. Oh, the number of fingers you grab is the price. Is, he just told me this is 20,500. I think I just did like 30,000 by mistake. Cool. deal. All right. 3,800 it is. Is that a good deal? It's the worst deal ever. <laughs> Oh my god. $3,800 is way over $100. That's all right. The heart gets what the heart wants. $2,100. So, come here, my goat. Ah, look at my dad's old goat. It's pretty fitting. What'd you pay? I got mine for $3,800. <laughs> you did? Yeah, because he's four you months old. Off. <laughs> <laughs> no. Now, are you always very competitive? <laughs> Oh, we're competitive. Oh, yeah, we're very competitive, you know. <laughs> but, you know, that, what I realized in this trip, though, all the physical stuff, he always wins now. I mean, when he was four, I would crush him. You dominate. <laughs> he guy's in better shape than I am now. All right. I know you'd rather watch this. It's an incredible story of, again, resurrection after an experience of devastating injury and pain. And what I love about it is that they also share that love they experienced with the world. And so they help us see the world uh, with its beauty, even though they go to places where you don't think of beauty, uh, you think of problems, but they show how people come together and work together. And that love can become a tool for resurrecting new life. And so I want to invite us to worship God together today in that spirit of resurrection and hope, bringing whatever is weighing us down or breaking our hearts, whether it's in our personal lives or in the world, to the healing power of Christ's resurrection. And so I want to invite you to join with us in the call to worship. The darkness is banished. The brightness of God's love floods in on us. Christ is risen from the dead. Christ is alive forevermore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. And please join us in singing hymn number 123 in the hymnals in your pews. And please stand as you are able.
We invite you at this time to share any joys or concerns that you may have. If you'd like to share something, just please raise your hand and share it from where you are. All right. I guess we will move into the prayers of the people. Lord of mystery and marvels, you have walked with us on this Lenten journey. You have seen how we have responded to those whom Jesus encountered along the path. We have heard their stories and have seen their pain. We have witnessed the love that Jesus offered to them and the miracles that have taken place in their lives. Now we gather on this brilliant day in a place filled with candles and flowers where the music soars and the spirits of all are lifted in joy. Help us today to remember that the journey to the cross doesn't end death, but becomes a road of joy. Lift our hearts and our spirits to sing your praises and gratitude for all that you have done for us. Let the light of Jesus Christ shine on us, in us, and through us as witness to your eternal presence and love for us. For we ask this in his name. Amen. We take a few moments of silence to bring before God our personal prayers. And we continue in prayer using the words our Lord Jesus Christ taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Amen. It's hard to speak after powerful music. But we speak the words of uh, the gospel today, proclaiming the message of the resurrection. So we will be uh, looking at it from the gospel of Matthew, chapter 28. And this is using the message. After the Sabbath, as the first light of the new week dawned, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to keep vigil at the tomb. Suddenly the earth reeled and rocked under their feet as God's angel came down from heaven, came right up to where they were standing. He rolled back the stone and then he sat on it. Shafts of lightning blazing from him. His garments shimmered snow white. The guards at the tomb were scared to death. They were so frightened they couldn't move. The angel spoke to the women. There is nothing to fear here. I know you're looking for Jesus, the one they nailed to the cross. He is not here. He was raised just as he said, come and look at the place where he was placed. Now get on your way quickly and tell his disciples, he is risen from the dead. He is going on ahead to you, of, ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. That's the message. The women, deep in wonder and full of joy, lost no time in leaving the tomb. They ran to tell the disciples. Then Jesus met them, stopping them in their tracks. Good morning, he said. They fell to their knees, embraced his feet, and worshipped him. Jesus said, you're holding on to me for dear life. Don't be frightened like that. Go tell my brothers that they are to go to Galilee, that I'll meet them there. And so today we come thinking of this gift of the resurrection and the story with it, all of its drama. It made me think of fireworks. My most recent experience of fireworks was in Los Angeles. Uh, this was uh, on February 13. Remember what was happening that day? The Super Bowl. So I was, I was it wasn't the most exciting place. I was uh, in Los Angeles and close enough that we could hear the fireworks, but I was with my mom on the last day of her life as she was taking her uh, final breaths and the game was going on. Then shortly after she took her last breath, the fireworks began. Of course, I was anxious to know who won. And I knew, I was like, I bet it's the, the Rams. And so I joked with my mom. I said, this is just for you, a celebration for you in heaven and as it is here on earth. Of course, you know, I wanted to think of it that way. Nobody else in all of Los Angeles thought that way. But that's, you know, that's how we sometimes look at little signs or the drama of something, especially when we're thinking of Easter and resurrection. And so I want to show you a little clip uh, from churches. Now, we have the brass today. We have Melzi singing special music. We have all this glorious stuff. But some churches go all out. They have pyrotechnics and all kinds of things. So this is one of those churches. What could go wrong? You put fire on carpet. Let's see. Then he walked right toward the door to stake his claim. A peal of thunder rent the skies, lightning forked his jagged head, right through the clouds to where the soldiers are laid.
I kept going. <laughs> Can we do that next year? <laughs> no. I don't think the insurance would cover that. <laughs> this is where you make a huge mistake and decide to, to show off Easter and do all of this drama. But the idea behind it is that this was a very big moment for uh, the story of Jesus. The problem with all the drama and all the flowers and all the music and all of that is that we tend to think of it happening once and it's done a long time ago and we're just remembering it. What we're forgetting in that process is that it's, the resurrection is about the life of Jesus and the life of God's love coming in for each one of us in the places where we feel dead, in the places where there's destruction, there is this need for resurrection, and it is something that happens often when people show the love of God and live out of that love. And one, one reflection I want to share with you a little bit from is by a woman by the name of Marilyn Robinson. She uh, wrote this book, The Death of Adam. And she talks about the problem with looking at the resurrection in that way, that it just happened once, and not thinking that it is something that happens to us. Because she says we tend to define the life of Jesus through the miracle of the resurrection instead of the other way around, that all of his life was a reflection that led up to the resurrection. So she says, we see, we say, see, because of this extraordinary miracle, Jesus is too, ex Jesus too is extraordinary and part of the greatest story ever told. And then she said, she talks about the problem with that, that he was really more of a plain man, an ordinary human being, just like us, uh, experienced life just like us, and the pain of death and of the pain of execution, the pain of an empire uh, hell-bent on, on killing people uh, if they stood in the way. And so she says it's really important to, uh, to think uh, to think of the resurrection as something that is about this Jesus that we knew in his life as an ordinary person, but then to think of the resurrection as much more than just the one event. And so today I want to think about some of the details with you from the Gospel of Matthew. Each Gospel presents the story in a, in a unique way. It's kind of like if we're all sitting here and we'll leave uh, worship and we'll talk about what happened in worship, each one of us will have a different way of telling the story. Especially when something deep happens for us, it's very hard to really explain it uh, in the fullness of what happened. And so thinking about the guards um, that were at the tomb, in the previous chapter in Matthew, it talks about that the Roman Empire was trying to make sure that there was no doubt that Jesus was dead. So they put guards at the tomb to make sure that nobody could say, well, you know, they take the body and they say he's been resurrected. So they wanted to make sure that their plan worked because they did a public display of having him crucified where people could see him because he was seen as a rebel, uh, someone that was leading a revolution against them. So they wanted to put that to rest to make sure that it wasn't going to continue on afterwards. So they had those guards there. So you see the description in the Gospel of Matthew. They were so scared. They were frozen. They couldn't even move, unlike what happened in the stage, on the stage where the, where the guard was running around trying to put out the fire. In the story, it tells us they were so terrified. They couldn't imagine such a thing. Now think about it. These people were, they had no relationship to Jesus. Most likely they didn't know much. They just had this experience of the power of the Holy Spirit. And they were terrified. And that is a symbol of the Roman Empire and its force being frozen not able to withstand the power of the love of God. And then the women, of course, there is in all the Gospels, there's the women witnessing. Now, in that culture, in that time, if you wanted a reliable witness, you wouldn't go find a woman to witness. Unfortunately, that's how the world of patriarchy worked. But 
the women were the ones that spoke. The women were the one, first ones that experienced the resurrection. They experienced this new life. Again, making this theme of Jesus continuing on, Jesus reaching out to those who were marginalized, who were not seen at the top of their game, the women, the outcasts. And so it was not a surprise that the resurrection witnesses, the first witnesses, were women. And then the angel speaking in the story. Again, remembering the beginning of the story of Jesus, who announced the coming of Jesus to Mary? An angel. And angels don't speak in ways where people think, okay, I'm, you know, all of us are going to be sitting here and we're going to hear it very clearly. Rarely does that happen. Most of what happens for us is personal. Something that we experience deep within, something more of a mystical experience. So they hear this angel speak, again, remembering the story of Jesus' beginning, coming through the announcement of, of the angel. So all of this to say is that the resurrection, as much as we'd like it to be this one-off special event, is about something much bigger. It's about us. It's about our world today needing that to happen. The resurrection is to remind us that life is eternal. And at the end of the day, love wins. As much as we feel beaten down by life, you might be experiencing that today, right now. Grieving the loss of someone you love. Grieving the loss of a significant relationship or health, or whatever you are dealing with, or looking at the world, looking at Ukraine. By the way, one of the episodes, the last episode in that Rogue Trip uh, show, is about Ukraine. And I love that, that they had no idea what was coming. And it's, it's beautiful talking about the people there and what they experienced. So thinking of all these challenges that we face, we could be discouraged and living life as if that's it, that's all there is, or we could be open to the mystery of the resurrection. We have no idea how resurrection happens in our lives, but we do know that through the power of love, it always comes. I know for me this year, resurrection is a little challenging, a little more personal, thinking of uh, the loss of my mom and dad, uh, one in February, on February, February 13th, and then my dad on March 9th. And thinking of their loss and this Easter without them being physically in this world. But yet, I know that the love we share is eternal. The connections, the people who care, the people who have uh, been around me, surrounding me with so many prayers. It is part of that witness. And I know that my parents are smiling down on all of you, especially those who have written cards twice. You, turn, you, you sent one card, and then you, probably some of you wrote me more than two cards. But, but you know, I was so, I was so at, at one point, I was like, I should write a note to the congregation saying, don't send cards again. I could just look at the ones from my mom's. And I told my, one of my friends about that idea. She said, that's a bad idea. Don't do it. Let them do what they need to do to help you receive. Be, be a good rece recipient of, of love. It is hard, but I know in those moments, whenever I opened a card, whenever I received a text, whenever somebody gave me a hug or shared a word of kindness, I felt the power of resurrection. I felt that connection to my mom and dad. And I was thinking about Easter this year, and I, I've, I've been so amazed at the many ways you share that gift of the resurrection. You bring the resurrection of Christ to so many. And so every time I see our volunteers helping those with dementia, I feel, I feel the power of the resurrection. Uh, for those of you who might not be aware, but we have a program once a month. Uh, Nancy, are you part of it? Who else? Is somebody else part of it here? The volunteers? K? K? Okay, where's K? She's up here. She's not up here. She, she's hiding. She, I always have a, a way of finding the person that leaves. 
<laughs> and naming them. But uh, Nancy and Kay could tell you this is a once a month program and that is offered to uh, as respite for those who might be suffering from dementia. And then the family could take some time, you know, to let them be there for, you know, four hours to receive love and care and uh, such joy. And every time I walk in there, I feel like I can't tell who is a guest and who is a volunteer because there's that sense of joy, that sense of love, and everybody is treated as they are so important. I know the last couple of days there have been many emails in the group of the volunteers because they've been talking about one of the uh, guests who just moved to more life. What was his name, Lauren? I can't remember his last name. But I can't tell you how powerful it is to see that sense of community, uh, that they're reaching out to the family, they're praying, they're remembering the gift of Lauren's life. If that's not resurrection, I don't know what is. Thinking of every time I see uh, the caring ministry, uh, the care ministry of uh, people who volunteer to go visit the sick, visit those who are, uh, who are struggling in life. Maybe you've been grieving or, and they send a card or they call or they reach out in love. In the last couple of years, they've been superstars because they would just, I mean, during the pandemic, they were for every week, the first, I want to say six months, it's not, where's Sandy Dix? Oh, here, she's hiding from me, Sandy. Was it for six months that you made phone calls every week? It was about 40, they took, they, it was the list of, it included about 40 people, and they made calls every week, even though they couldn't go. They were sending cards, they were making calls, they were just praying and surrounding people who were uh, more vulnerable with our love, with the love of the congregation. And there's Sandy for you. This is in one of our meetings. Uh, they were sharing in that moment of, of joy and that sense of connection and deep connection. Uh, if any of you are involved, and Kay is involved, so I need to find out where Kay went. But, uh, but Nancy is involved as well in the Jackson School Ministry. And uh, Jean, are you a volunteer there still? We have a few people that go from our church every week and help in the classroom with the children out of a sense of connection to the community. Again, every time I see those, I think I hear about the stories of the sharing of the support of a school in our community that's nurturing the lives of children, that's helping them grow. To know that people care is just really one of the amazing ways the resurrection happens through you. Now, every time I see a prayer shawl, given in the name of Christ, in the way of Christ, I'm also reminded of that sense of connection. Uh, they give out so many of these. I don't know. They make hats for the hospital for newborns. They make uh, blankets for different organizations in the community. Again, giving of themselves and surrounding the people they give these shawls with prayers. I know my mom was one of the recipients, and she appreciated it so much. She said, oh, for me, they thought of me. I'm in California. How could they be thinking of me right now? I said, that's how they are. If they hear of anyone in need, that's how they, they do it. Now, we have Crossroads House, and thinking of Crossroads House is a home for the dying, and it's right next door to us. Is this it's behind me, isn't it? Okay, that way. Uh, so Crossroads House is a building that used to be uh, the, the manse for the pastor, uh, where pastors used to live. But then uh, pastors decided they didn't want to live there or whatever happened with that building got old. And then a new group came in town that wanted to do this care for the dying at the end of life. And it's an incredible ministry of joy. It's amazing. You think, you know, at the end of life, you know, it's very difficult and, and the family is really struggling. But in that place, there is so much love that is shared that life is renewed. 
as people's bodies are, were, are declining, usually their spirits are soaring because of that experience of love. Same is true for their families. And then on this side, I gotta get my orientation here in my head right. Uh, as you drive into the church, there is a building right there, again, owned by the church and uh, is donated uh, to the Children's uh, Center. And it's uh, ministry, again, for those who are struggling, children who had been abused and their families. It's heartbreaking when you see the cop cars coming and you know what they're dealing with. But then, then there's this. I, think, I see the kids and their families leaving with these blankets. And I know that our people gave those blankets, reminding them that they are surrounded by love. This horrible experience of what the worst humanity can do to each other is countered by the love that is shared in the community. Every time I see this sign outside of our church, God loves everyone, no exceptions, in rainbow colors. I know that is such, there is so much power in that statement. And it speaks to a deep value of love, of inclusion, of radical hospitality, to think a message of hope right out there. And I tell you, I get that, I get so many comments from people that are driving by, walking by, of how that sign reminds them that there is a community in this town that says God loves you for who you are. And so today, I want to remind us that resurrection, yes, it happened a long time ago, and that's the faith we affirm, but it also happens today for each of us. And that's the challenge, that's the invitation for you to remember that love is all around us and is always inviting us to grow in love to infinity and beyond. Amen. Will you please stand and join me in singing hymn number 302, I Danced in the Morning.
for the blessing. These are words from Bishop Michael Curry. Through the power of the resurrection, go believing that when love is the way, poverty will become history. When love is the way, the earth will be a sanctuary. When love is the way, we will lay down our swords and shields and by the riverside, down by the riverside, to study war no more. When love is the way, there's plenty good room, plenty good room for all of God's children. Because when love is the way, we actually treat each other well, like we're actually family. Friends, go in peace. Uh, go in believing that the power of the resurrection is yours. Through the power of love, you can bring resurrection of hope and hope to all you encounter. Go with the peace of Christ. Please be seated. One more song. <laughs> A crown of thorns placed on his head. He knew that he would soon be dead. He said, did you forget me, Father, did you? They nailed him to a wooden cross. Soon all the world would feel the loss of Christ. the stone 
They saw that they were not alone, for Jesus Christ has risen. Hallelujah. 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 Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. <laughs> Please turn to your neighbors and share the peace of Christ with them. Are you guys... Are you